Hi everyone, this is video number 13 of the Regents Chemistry curriculum and our topic of the day is solutions. Today you're going to be able to uh, calculate the concentration of different solutions in parts per million. You're also going to learn how to create a solution of a specific molarity and molarity is another word for saying concentration and uh, you're also going to uh, be able to determine whether certain molecules are polar or not and whether they're uh, bonds, the bonds that make up a molecule, the bonds between the atoms are polar or not. And uh, you're also going to learn how you can possibly decrease the freezing point or increase the boiling temperature of water. With that said, let's get started. Here are a bunch of true or false statements. Uh, read them, pause the video, determine whether they're true or false. Take your time, read carefully. And uh, let's get started. Okay, so let's first start thinking about solutions. What are solutions? Uh, a solution is made of a solute and a solvent. Okay, we, we call water the universal solvent because it dissolves a lot of stuff. So what's unique about water is that water is polar which means if you put water in water, it'll dissolve. So water is polar. Polar is another word for dissolves in water. And therefore, because it's polar, it is going to dissolve other polar substances. So anything else that's polar will dissolve in water. So NaCl is an example of a compound, your table salt, you put it in water, it's gonna dissolve in water. So a sugar, C6H12O6, is an example of a molecular compound that's polar it's also going to dissolve in water so like dissolves like okay polar dissolves polar now if we're talking about something that's not polar on the other hand for example uh, oil oil uh, is a not a polar substance so therefore oil will dissolve only nonpolar substances. So nonpolar dissolves nonpolar. An example of a nonpolar substance would be something like fat. Okay. Uh, another example would be grease. All right. So moving along, moving on, we said uh, all solutions are made of solutes and solvents. So a, an example of a solute could be salt. You can have a solid solute and you can have a gas solute. Salt would be an example of a solid solute and uh, a carbon dioxide would be another example uh, of a gas solute. So something else you should know about uh, the solubility of salt in, in water or the solubility of gas in water. Uh, solubility of a solid in water or solubility of a gas. So let's take a look at table G very quickly. Table G shows you uh, the amount of solutes that you can possibly dissolve in a hundred grams of water at different temperature. If we notice, since we were talking about solids and gases, if we notice a lot of the curves are going up, which means there's a direct relationship between temperature and solubility. So with increase in temperature, you'll have more and higher and higher solubility, meaning more and more solutes can dissolve in water. However, if we look carefully, we'll see three curves that are going down. Here's the HCl curve, here's the ammonia curve, and here's the SO2 curve. So these curves are going down because these curves represent gases, which means that uh, they have uh, these gases have an indirect relationship uh, when it comes to solubility and temperature. So with higher temperature, you have lower uh, solubility. So what can we conclude from that? We can conclude that as you uh, gases will only dissolve in water or will dissolve best in water at lower temperatures, while solids will dissolve best in water at higher temperatures. Okay. Another thing you can do to increase the solubility of a gas in water would be to uh, increase the pressure on the gas. When you think of gases, just think of soda bottles. You always increase uh, the solubility of the carbon dioxide in the soda 
by keeping it in the fridge and uh, increasing the pressure and sealing it with a bottle cap. Okay, so now uh, there are three types of solutions. There are uh, saturated solutions, unsaturated, and supersaturated. Okay, these this is in terms of table G. These are the three types of solutions. So let's uh, in order to explain that, let's focus on one curve, one specific curve. Let's take a look at this NaNO3 curve. Okay, and then let's look at a particular temperature. Let's look at 30 degrees Celsius. So at 30 degrees Celsius, uh, the maximum amount of sodium nitrate that I can dissolve in 100 grams of water is going to be about 96 grams. So you can make a saturated sodium saturated 100 gram solution of sodium nitrate by adding 96 grams of sodium nitrate to 100 grams of water. If you add 96 grams of sodium nitrate to 100 grams of water, all of the 96 grams of the sodium nitrate will dissolve. Let's say you add only 70 grams of sodium nitrate to the 100 grams of water at 30 degrees. Only 70 grams means that you can still add 26 more grams of sodium nitrate. So if you added 70 grams, you, ha you have what we call an unsaturated solution. Unsaturated. If you added 90 grams, you have what we call a saturated solution because that's the maximum amount of solute that you can possibly dissolve. If you added, let's say, 120 grams, you have what we call super saturated solution. Now, it's very important to know that uh, at 30 degrees Celsius, adding more than 90 grams will not change the concentration. So the maximum that you could possibly dissolve is 90 grams. If you added 120 grams, then all of that extra amount that you added will settle. So in this case, from 96 to 120, all of that extra amount is going to settle at the bottom of the container and it will not dissolve and therefore also will not change the concentration. If it does not dissolve in the water, it is not going to change its concentration. Okay, so super saturated up here saturated right on the curve, unsaturated below the curve. That's it for table G. Let's take a look at an example of a question. Here's an example. Uh, how many grams of solute would settle if 60 grams of NaNO3 is dissolved in 50 grams of water at 50 degrees Celsius? So now I have 60 grams of NaNO3 dissolved in 50 grams of water, not 100 grams of water like table G shows, at 50 degrees Celsius. Take a look at table G. Now I still I have a 50 degrees Celsius and I have 60 grams of water, 60 sorry 60 grams of NaNO3, 60 grams of NaNO3 dissolved in 50 grams of water. So obviously if you have 60 grams in 50 grams of water, then you're going to have 120 grams, double that, just multiply this whole thing by 2, in 100 grams of water. Okay, so now we're looking at 50 degrees Celsius, and we're thinking of 120 grams in 100 grams of water. Well, it shows here that the maximum you can dissolve at 50 degrees Celsius is 115. So, the maximum you can dissolve at 50 degrees Celsius is 115 grams. This tells us that there will be 5 grams extra. We have 5 additional grams of sodium nitrate that will settle for every 100 grams of water. This means that we were, we're going to have 2.5 grams of sodium nitrate that will settle for 50 grams of water. Okay?
So five grams is for 100, then two and a half is going to be for 50. Going back to the question. So if given 120 grams, then 120 minus 115 would yield five grams to precipitate at the bottom of the solution. That is going to be per 100 grams of water which means that you're going to have two and a half grams per that will settle per 50 grams of water. So the answer would be two and a half. Okay. Moving on. Molarity and parts per million. So molarity, just another word for concentration and parts per million is a way to measure concentration. So let's take a look at table T because it contains the formulas that you need to be familiar with uh, to calculate molarity and to calculate uh, parts per million. So here we have concentrations to calculate uh, parts per million. You say the, you, cal you ca measure the mass of the solute divided by the mass of the solution and multiply it by a million. For to calculate the molarity, you measure the, the amount of moles of the solute that you have, divide by the amount of liters, and that will give you the molarity. The liters of solution, the mass of the solution. Remember, solution is what we're talking about here, not water. Water is not a solution. Solution is the is a solvent, water, and the solute, the solid or the gas or whatever you have. It's the so here we're talking about the mass of the solvent and the mass of the solute. That's what the formula calls for here. Same thing here. Liters of the solution. So if I say I added five grams of salt to a hundred grams of water, the mass of the solution in this case would be a hundred and five grams, not a hundred grams. Okay, be careful. This comes on the regions all the time. All right. Let's take a look at an example. What is the concentration in parts per million of a solution that contains two moles of sodium chloride dissolved in 1254 milliliters of water? So now I have milliliters. The formula said moles over liters will give you the concentration. Or the mass of the solute over the mass of the solvent or the mass of the salt solution will give you the uh, parts per million. So let's take a look at this. The mass of two moles of sodium chloride is going to be equal to 58 grams, which is the mass of one mole of sodium chloride. Uh, to measure the mass of sodium chloride, you simply look at the periodic table. Here's the periodic table. So sodium has a mass of 23 grams. Chlorine has a mass of 35 grams. Approximately 23 plus 35 is going to give you 58 grams. So the mass of one NaCl is 58 grams. Here I have two NaCLs. Okay, two NaCLs. So therefore I have 58 times two, which gives me a total mass of 116 grams. So the mass of the solute is 116 grams. Now the mass of the solution, let's think for a second. Uh, we have a 116 grams of NaCl that were added to 1254 milliliters of water. We know that one milliliter of water equal one gram of water. So 1254 grams of water is what we have, plus the 116 grams. So 1254 plus 116 will be the mass of the solution. So 116 grams divided by the mass of the solution multiplied by one million will give you your part per million. Okay, so that's a way to uh, calculate the molarity, uh, sorry, the parts per million of this solution. So that means that we have 84.68 part of NaCl for 1 million part of the solution. Okay, 
Now, if this same exact question was asking you to calculate molarity, then obviously molarity equals two moles divided by liters. So in this case, you're going to take your two moles of NaCl and you're going to divide it by not 1254 milliliters. You're going to convert that to liters. So 1254, if you look at table C, here we have table C, which shows the convergence. So to convert milliliters to liters, you will multiply the milliliters by 10 to the negative 3. So your 1254 milliliters here, multiply them by 10 to the negative 3, and you will know that you have 1.254 liters. So 2 divided by 1.254 liters will give you the molarity also known as the concentration of that solution. Okay. Lastly, colligative properties. Uh, actually, before we go on to this, I told you that you're going to be able to make solutions of certain concentrations. So let's say I wanted to make a 5 molar solution of... Uh, let's make it make it more reasonable. Let's say I wanted to make a two molar solution of uh, sodium chloride. Okay, so and I wanted to make uh, five liters of this. Okay, so now I have to figure out how many moles of sodium chloride I need to add. However. There is no scale that measures moles, okay? There is a scale that measures grams, but there's no scale that measures moles. So what you need to do first here is calculate the number of moles, and then once you find your moles, you're going to convert it to grams, and then you will know how much you have to weigh and, and dissolve in uh, water to create a 5-liter solution that, is, uh, that has a concentration of 2 molar. molar. Okay, so we're going to cross multiply here. 5 liters multiplied by 2 gives you a total of uh, x equals to 10 moles. So you need 10 moles of sodium chloride. 10 moles of sodium chloride is going to equal to an x grams over uh, 58 grams. Uh, this is simply just using table T formula for calculating the amount of grams. Here's table T. Mole calculations to convert moles to grams. You don't have a given mass, you have a mass. So the amount of moles that you have is 10. And the gram formula mass of... Uh, Salt is 58 grams for one mole. Simply you are going to only just cross multiply here. So 10 times 58 is going to give you 580 grams of NaCl. Okay, so going back to our question here. We're going to need 580 grams of NaCl. And so what we're going to do now to make a 2 molar solution, we are going to put the 580 grams of NaCl in here. And then we are going to add water until we get to a, a total of 5 liters. Until we get 5 liters. You don't do this backwards. You don't put the water first and then add the salt afterwards. Because if you have 5 liters of water and you add any amount of salt to this 5 liters of water, you're going to have a much more, you're going to have a lot more than 5 liters afterwards. At the end, you're going to have more. Because if you have a certain amount of water and you add something to it, the level of water rises, the volume of water increases. Or it become, the volume of the solution will be, you're going to end up making more than 5 liters. So remember, the molarity formula is moles of solute divided by uh, liters of solution, divided by liters of solution. 
So you can't have five liters of water and add salt to it. It doesn't work that way. Make sure you have the salt and then you add water up until you reach five liters of the solution. And then you'll end up with a two molar solution. Okay. Now, calligraphy properties is just uh, simply telling us how we can increase the uh, boiling point of water and decrease the freezing point of water. Why is this important? Because if uh, I'm trying to, let's say, boil eggs and I want to cook them faster, I want to increase the temperature of at which the water boil at, at which the water boils, and if uh, I uh, want to uh, prevent icing in my driveway. I want to decrease the temperature at which my at which the, the the water freezes. Okay, so how do we do that? We simply do that by increasing the concentration of a substance. So in this way, uh, how do we do this? Uh, we simply just add salt in the winter time. If it's snowing outside, we add salt. Okay, to our uh, to, to to the snow, so we put salt in the driveway so that when the snow mixes with the salt, the freezing point of the snow decreases. So now snow will no longer freeze at zero degrees Celsius. It will probably freeze at a lower temperature. And same thing when I'm cooking the eggs, I add salt to my boiling water so that now uh, my water is not going to boil at 100 degrees Celsius. So my water is not going to turn into gas at 100 degrees Celsius. And uh, my water now is going to boil maybe at a temperature that's higher than 100 degrees Celsius. So this way, the, the, the eggs will cook faster because now the temperature of the water is much higher than uh, before. Okay, uh, the adding salt, uh, not any salt can increase the temperature of water uh, sufficiently. So some salts will increase the temperature of water better than others. And... Uh, what you need to know is that you need to uh, look at table F to see which salts actually dissolve in water. So let's take a look at table F. Here we go. So group one elements on the periodic table or group one ions, when you mix them with anything, you're automatically gonna make a salt that dissolves. It doesn't matter what you mix them with. So NaCl will definitely dissolve, uh, NaI will dissolve in water and so on. Okay, here are the halogens. Let's take a look at chlorine. If I put Ag, Cl in water, AgCl is not going to dissolve in water because these are the soluble compounds and here are the exceptions for what makes them insoluble. Looking at this side, we have the insoluble compounds and here are the exceptions for what makes them soluble. Okay? So, silver. if I put silver chloride If I put silver chloride and sodium chloride and calcium chloride in three different containers that contain the same amount of water, The container that will have the, the water that will freeze at the lowest temperature will be your sodium chloride. Why? Because this silver chloride is not going to dissolve, so that's out of the picture. Now this sodium chloride is going to dissociate in water as sodium and chlorine. But this calcium chloride is now going to dissociate in water as calcium, as chlorine, and as another chlorine. So, 
one mole of calcium, one mole of chlorine, one more mole of chlorine will give you a total of three moles of ions that dissociate in water. That's more, the more ions that dissociate, the lower is the freezing point of water. So the more ions, so you want to think of this uh, temperature scale, let's say from zero to 100 for water, zero is where you freeze and 100 is where you boil. If you increase the amount of ions that dissolve in water, add more and more ions. The more ions that you add, the higher that the boiling point will be. The hot gets hotter, so the higher the boiling point. And if you keep adding ions, the lower is the freezing point. So your freezing point will drop below zero and your boiling point will increase above a hundred degrees celsius that is okay very important that we learn how to read this table so let's just give one more example of this here for example chromate chromate generally is insoluble but if you mix chromate with calcium you are going to have a soluble compound okay same thing if you mix it with magnesium you're going to have a soluble compound if you mix it with any group one elements or with any group one ions, you're going to have soluble ammoni ammonium soluble as well. On the other hand here, nitrate will always be soluble, doesn't matter what you mix it with. Uh, here, sulfates are generally soluble. However, if you mix them with silver, calcium, strontium, barium, lead, they're going to be insoluble. You're going to have an insoluble compound. All right, here's a little bit about uh, solubility of a molecule and solubility of bonds. So if you're asked whether the following molecules are polar or not polar, it is important that you're thinking of symmetry. So here is a nice way for you to remember. Remember to snap. Uh, when a molecule snap, S-N-A-P, if a molecule is symmetrical, the molecule is not polar. If it is asymmetrical, then it is polar. Okay, so here's an example of a symmetrical molecule. Notice that the right side looks just like the left side, and the top side looks like just like the bottom side. So this is clearly a symmetrical molecule, and if it is symmetrical, it is not polar. Here's an example of an asymmetrical molecule in which the right side does not look like the left side even though the top side looks just like the bottom side. So this is clearly an asymmetrical molecule. And because it is asymmetrical, it has an asymmetrical distribution of charge. Therefore, it is polar. Okay. So uh, moving on a little bit further about the uh, polarity of bonds. So if you want to determine which of the bonds inside this molecule uh, are polar, all you have to do is calculate the electronegativity difference. So you go on to table S. So here I go on to table S. Okay. I see the electronegativity values here and the ionization energies here. So looking at uh, bromine, here we go. Bromine, bromine, it is number Thirty-five. The electronegativity value of bromine is 3.0. The electronegativity value of carbon is 2.6. And the electronegativity value of hydrogen is 2.2. Okay, 3.0, 2.6, and 2.2. Going back over here, we see that bromine is 3.0. Carbon is... 2.6 and hydrogen is 2.2 now automatically you should know that hydrocarbon bonds are not polar so 2.6 minus 2.2 will give you an electronegativity difference of 0.4 uh, bromine 3.0 minus 2.6 is uh, also going to give me an electronegativity difference of uh, 0.4 however uh, bromine is a halogen and when a halogen mixes with water with, with carbon it is going to uh, create a soluble bond so if you want a general rule 
if the electronegativity difference is equal or below 2.4, if it equals or is less than 0.4, then you have a non-polar covalent bond. Here's an exception, bromine, carbon and bromine. If it is above 0.4, if the electronegativity difference is greater than 0.4, then you have a polar bond. And if that bond is uh, between two nonmetals, then it's a polar covalent. Uh, if it uh, is above, if the electronegativity difference is above 1.7, then you have, an, uh, you have a polar ionic bond. And you have a metal and a nonmetal. So above 1.7, made of a metal and a nonmetal, ionic, polar ionic, above uh, 0.4, polar covalent, uh, less than or equal to 0.4, nonpolar. All right, now let's go back to the questions. Here they are. Read the following statements, determine whether they're true or false. Okay. And that's it.